Father, what a humbling privilege to sit before you and to hear you speak. Lord, we know that as Psalm 138 says, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And so now, Lord, we come to your word longing to hear from the God of the word. Lord, I know that so many of us have brought so many different emotions into this room. Whether they be joys, sorrows, struggles, suffering. And yet, Lord, not one of them escapes your attention. And so I pray that you would meet us in this moment, that your spirit would be turning the eyes of our hearts to behold Jesus Christ as our ultimate delight, and that you would be drawing in those who don't yet know you and encouraging those who are walking with you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would guard my heart, my mouth, my thoughts from only doing and saying what would make most of Jesus. I pray that your word would be our rule, your spirit would be our teacher, your glory, our concern, and your son, our joy, as we hear and then leave and respond to this word that you've given for your church. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the many people um, who have given their lives uh, for the support of this country, but ultimately, Lord, as we celebrate Memorial Day, but we ultimately thank you for Jesus Christ, your son, who gave up his life so we could have eternal life. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You guys ever heard the saying, he looks just like his dad? Or she really is a chip off the old block. Carl asked me before the service if it'd be all right with Aveline coming up for announcements. I was like, Carl, you're a sermon illustration today, a living, walking sermon illustration. See, sometimes flattery or imitation is flattery, and sometimes it's just biology. You look at Aveline, and it's impossible to miss the the wonderful resemblance of mommy and daddy in her. Sometimes imitation is a form of biology. And so when we turn to Ephesians chapter 5 today, it is so interesting that in verse 1, Paul is telling us to bear the Father's traits. He's saying explicitly, church, all of us, be imitators of, of God. Hey, I want you in nurture and nature, in appearance and activity, to look increasingly like the one who has made you. And so as we unpack Ephesians 5, verse 1 to 17, which we're going to do over the next three weeks, we're going to hear this encouragement for us as a church to increasingly be like the God who's done everything for us in Christ Jesus. And specifically, Paul tells us, I want you to be like your father, And here's what that looks like. I want you to walk or live in love today. Next week, I want you to walk or live in light. And then in two weeks from now, I want you to walk or live in wisdom. And so Paul resumes this letter that was written to the first century church near Ephesus in 62 AD. And yet it has timeless and relevant import for us in Carterville in 2019. And here's why. Can you imagine what it would be like to be part of a diverse, Jesus-loving family that increasingly imitates God together? Increasingly, when we interact with each other, we say, you love me in the way that Christ first loved me. Or when the world looks on at us in our corporate life together and they say, those people... There is something attractively different about them. It's not just they're a club. They are a loving family. They seem to be a representation of the kind of love that Scripture puts forward. See, my burden for us is not that we just understand these commandments in Scripture. My burden for us is that we would love the God who has first loved us, and out of that, we would love one another with a radical, life-changing, world-impacting, gospel-centered love. This is the message that Paul has for us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. He follows up Ephesians chapter 3, all that God has done for us. In chapters 4 to 6, here's what we should do in response to him is worship. We should today walk in love as Christ loved us, and he's going to spend his time today answering two questions for us. Why in the world should we walk in love towards each other? And how in the world do we do that? 
sounds pretty hard to imitate God in love, doesn't it? And it is, apart from God. (laughs) So he's going to answer, why should we do this? How do we do it? Keep the text open, please. I'd love for you to see that these are not merely my thoughts or words, but these are God's inspired and errant words. Beginning in verse 1, why should we love? Well, because we are beloved children of God in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 1. Please look at verse 1. Therefore... Be imitators of God as beloved children. Beloved children. It's as if God is telling us the three most important words you'll ever hear from me. I love you. I love you. Those are the three most important words you can ever say or hear from someone else. Think about your own lives. When have these words rang loudest and clearest and most meaningful? Remember your wedding day on the altar? Three words that changed you and someone else forever. Or maybe in the hospital when you're holding your your newborn. Three words you couldn't stop saying. Or maybe at a tragic funeral or saying goodbye to your aging parents. Words that carried a lifetime of significance. I love you. But what does love mean? (laughs) What does love mean? The ever-popular question. One wise person said it like this. A wise pastor said, Love, according to Scripture, is willing self-sacrifice for the good of another that does not require reciprocation or that the person being loved is deserving. True love is the willing self-sacrifice to pursue someone else's good, their entire good, even at the cost to yourself. It's the sort of no strings attached, don't have to jump through the hoops or earn it from me sort of love that frees the beloved one from the fear of abandonment or rejection. They know you're going to be steadfast. And so, yes, Paul says, be imitators of God. Imitate, imitate, do, do, do. But only because of what's been done for you. Love as those who are children, secure in the love of God for you. See, we will not imitate or be like our Father in love until we realize how safe and steadfast and powerful the love of God is for us as his children through faith in Christ Jesus. And yet, I say this knowing full well that for some of you, considering what it means to be a child of God is almost impossible. It's almost offensive. Because we hear about this wonderful, perfect, heavenly Father, and then we look to the fathers and mothers of our lives who have hurt us, who have condemned us, who have abandoned us even. How could God be a father? And yet he's a perfect, eternal, heavenly Father who's never failed where our parents have failed. And so some of us, it's pain that gets in the way of seeing ourselves as children of God through faith in Jesus. For some of us, it's pride. The other end of the spectrum God, look at me. I deserve, I am your best child. I'm the one who's in church every time the doors are open. I'm the one who gives more money than anyone else, has the best behaved kids, and I went on every single mission trip. All good things, but not things that warrant salvation or adoption to him as children of God. See, we are only made children of God through faith in the perfect Son of God who lived the sinless life, died the sacrificial death, and then rose to a victorious resurrection saying all who once were rebels can now become children. That's the incredible love of God. And see, I know it's a love that we won't understand until we understand what Scripture says about us. And so our desires to love rightly are exposed as trivial efforts that have proven nothing but fruitful and loving wrongly. Remember Mark chapter 12? Jesus is asked, how would you summarize the law? What does he say? It's simple, but it's not simplistic. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. I already faltered. (laughs) And then he adds to it, and... Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh my goodness. I have failed. Jameson Parker has failed the conditions needing, warranting God's love. 
And, and naturally, each and every one of us has too. Think first horizontally. We'll start with the easy one. You ever gotten irritated with someone else? You might be thinking, man, Jameson, you're preaching too long. <laughs> Hard to love one another as self. That's what scripture calls sin. Now think hor- or vertically. We don't love each other well. It's impossible. Have you, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and all the time, loved the Lord your God? Has he been your one, ch- one thing, your chief joy? See, David says in Psalm 27, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and gaze upon his beauty. He just wants to be with him. For you, for me, what's the one thing? The one thing, even right now, that you might be feeling, oh, if I just had that, I'd be content. I'd, be, I'd feel worthy, worthwhile. My life would have significance. It, the, Lord, one thing I want is a little more money in my bank account. One thing I want is that promotion, the affirmation from my spouse, my friends, my colleagues, my neighbors. One thing I want is my kids to sleep or be behaved. Not bad things, but terrible gods. Things that will always want, leave you wanting for more. Things that will always lead you to loving others less than you love yourself. Loving God less than he deserves as God. And so we let the word of God expose us. Those who have been made to love rightly have this proclivity to love wrongly. And scripture says that demands God's justice because he has loved perfectly. He is holy. We have failed the conditions of his love. You and I are not naturally children of God. We are naturally rebels. We should be cast out as orphans for eternity. But, but the wonderful, reckless love of God that we've been singing about in these songs before is so reckless that it would come to adopt orphans, rebels like you and I, and make us children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the love of God that is not unconditional. It's not conditional. It's not unconditional in the sense that, oh, I just love you no matter what. Be whoever you want to be. Be whatever you want to be. And, you know, I'll still accept you. It's not a blanket acceptance. It's not even conditional. It doesn't say, you have to jump through all those hoops yourself or else. It's over. It's as one wise pastor says, a contra-conditional love. Stay with me for a minute. I know it's not in the dictionary, but it's a meaningful word. A contra-conditional love. Contrary, contrary to what I have done, contrary to what you have done, contrary to what we have done, God offers to bestow his love on rebels. God sends his son to meet the conditions that we have failed to meet so that through faith in him, we can receive his love. It's a contra-conditional love where God says, I will not just merely accept you as you are, I will love you as Jesus was for you and his life, his death. Is resurrection. Listen to the description of God's love for us in Romans 5. You remember Romans 5? For while we were still weak, oh, while we were unlovely, while we were unloving, while we were still weak, at exactly the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely would one die for a righteous person. One might dare to die for a good person. But God shows his love for us. And that while we're still sinners, while we failed to love rightly, Christ died for us. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the picture of sacrificial, astounding love. God puts forward his conditions. Perfect obedience and a willing sacrifice. Jameson can't offer those. No one else here can offer those. Only Jesus Christ can. And the mercy of God is that Jesus Christ does when we were rebellious to him. See, it's God who says, I love you when I look upon you as I look upon my son who lived the perfect life, who died the sacrificial death and was risen from the dead. It's he for me unto salvation. It's his perfect love that casts out my wrong love. He is our perfect substitute. And the only way that we are adopted as children of God is through faith in the son of God. See, 
this love changes us. It says in John 3.16, the, verse, the first verse you were taught as a child, probably. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. See, God gives his Son so that we would have new life. New life as children of God. Not just forgiven and left as orphans, but forgiven, loved, redeemed, and brought near. He brings us near to be with him. He longs to be with his children. And now the Spirit himself testifies with us that we are indeed children of God. Guys, have you gotten this? Church, have you gotten this? This is not a theological fact for us to agree with and say, huh, I'm glad he's my father. But have you received the love of a perfect father? Have you received the love of one who would say, I love you so much so that I'm willing to give my perfect son so that you could become my adopted sons and daughters? This is the kind of love that changes you, that compels a response. It's the kind of love that says, Jesus is no longer just useful to me. He is beautiful to me. He is no longer just useful. He is beautiful to me. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, the love of Christ controls us. It compels a response. It's the kind of love that takes this ever-tightening grip on your heart until you have to respond. And the only two responses are, huh, or I love you. That's it. There is no in-between. There is no I'm kind of in the God boat. He wasn't kind of on the cross. Our Father loved us perfectly. And my plore, plea, plore is not a word, is it? I don't know. My plea is that you would receive the love of God as a perfect father. That you would look upon the cross, look upon his son, and see, my God loved me so much that he would send his son to die for me. That's got to be the first and the last thing we think about, day in, day out. It's the kind of love that if you've yet to receive, if you've yet to say, God, I am so unlovely and so unloving, and yet now for the first time your spirit has helped me see that you are perfectly loving and forgiving, well, now run to him. Give him your sin. Receive his forgiveness. We have a missional God. He has come for the sick and the, and the lost like you and I. If you've yet to receive his good news, do so today. Why would you wait on receiving this love? And if you have received this love, are you settling for Jesus being useful and not just beautiful? See, I ask the Lord for all of my needs because he is a sovereign and powerful God. Hebrews 1 says he upholds the universe by the word of his power. When I have a need, I'm going to the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. Amen? But at the same time, increasingly so, I want the one thing of my heart to be that I would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I would gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. I just want to love him more. And that's what Jesus has made us for, to know and love God. Would you ask him to help you know him, to love him, and to depend on and know this great love that changes us? See, God doesn't accept us with a blanket acceptance. He loves us as Jesus is for us and his life his death, his resurrection. And it's only when you come to realize this will you then be, have, will be able to have any hopes of loving anyone else in a way that comes close to loving you as yourself. See, the love of God comes to us to save us, rescues us from God's wrath, the best salvation we could ever need. But then the love of God lives in us to change us. The narrative of Scripture says he's recreating us He tells us to be imitators, but then he sends his spirit to live inside of us to increasingly make us like him. And so in verse 2, Paul answers the next question. How do we do this? How, How in the world do I imitate God and walk in love? Well, the answer is, look to the one who loved you first. Look with me back at verse 2. Again, I have neglected half the content on my sermon manuscript, but I pray that the Spirit would be our teacher, and today, that is what's happening. (laughs) 
How do we love as God loved us? Well, we love first by looking at Christ. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The power to love is knowing you've been loved perfectly. The model for love is looking to the one who has loved us perfectly. In verse 2, one simple sentence, we see four components of what Jesus has done to love us. And yes, this would be the uh, undesirable, like, six-point sermon. But there are four things that Jesus has done to show what perfect love looks like that you and I must understand if we're going to love each other well. Jesus has loved us initially. He gave before we asked. Jesus has loved us sacrificially. He gave himself. Himself, his very life. And Jesus has loved purposely. He gave himself up for us. There's an aim to it. And then Jesus has loved delightfully. He was the fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the sort of love that has to mark our lives as a church. See, I, I spend time in verse 2 because here's what I think could happen if we really understand the love of Christ in verse 2. If we were to be the kind of church that loved with a, I'll love you first, the kind of love that says, I'll lay down my comforts for you, the kind of love that says, I'll pursue your good even at the cost of my good, the kind of love that's pleasing to God, can you imagine what kinds of things we would see grow up. The, and the same sort of evidence of God's grace that I've seen in the past and have been witness to as I walk with you the ways you love each other. Let's increasingly love as Christ loved us. Have sacrificial relationships mark our lives together. First, Christ loved initially. Look with me here. He gave in verse 2. He gave Jesus started loving first. He didn't ask for love. He didn't receive love. He gave. We love because he first loved us. He set his desire to do so. What might it look like for you, for me, to instead of waiting for someone else in the church to love you before you love them, to say, I'm going to initiate love because God initiated love towards me in Christ Jesus, and that's all the initiatory need I, I have to love others. What might it look like to say after church, I'm going to start the conversation with that person I've seen like every other Sunday for who knows how long, but I really don't know them yet. And I love them as a brother or sister in Christ that I want to get to know them. Even if it's a little ding to my pride. I think I should know their name, but I don't yet. That's all right. None of us do. <laughs> Let's get to know each other. Initiate. Start that sort of love. What might it look like to after church say, you know what? I'd love for you to go out to lunch with us. We're going to go eat. You're probably going to go eat. It's lunchtime. Let's do it together. Let's initiate instead of wait. See, Jesus initiated love. Next, the love of Jesus is sacrificial. Sacrificial. Look at verse 2 again. He gave himself. He gave himself. It doesn't say that Jesus gave everything but his life. It doesn't say Jesus gave to the point of his own comfort. He gave himself. We look back on his eternity preceding his ministry, eternity after his ministry, and then in the middle of it, we have 33 years of blood, sweat, tears, leaving eternal comfort to enter into our mess, and then walking up to a cross to die the most painful, horrific death ever. If anyone has given himself fully and totally, it is Jesus Christ for us. He gave himself. He paid the cost that God demanded, and yet we couldn't. See, and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the perfect payment for our sin. Therefore, beloved, we should love one another as he has loved us. What might it look like for you to love sacrificially in this church? To not just say, well, I'm going to love until it's comfortable. <laughs> I'm going to love until I have something else better to do. What might it look like to say, it's not convenient for me to have dinner with everyone else on Wednesday nights, but I still love one another 
uh, in this church and I so want to be used to love them, then I'm going to try to make time to have dinner with them. What might it look like to say, it's really hard to get the kids out of the house for a small group during the week, but I so love and know that others need me as much as I need them in the church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that time aside and I'll try to catch up on sleep some t- other time. <laughs> One other very meaningful way that I think we can love sacrificially in the church is through forgiving. Forgiving. The ultimate demonstration of sacrificial love was to forgive our sin. In verse 32 of Ephesians chapter 4, we are commended to forgive as Christ forgave us. That's the ultimate demonstration of sacrificial love. Remembering that we are sinners saved by grace. Who are we to withhold forgiveness from anyone? That can start within your own home, but has ripple effects of the greatest kind when demonstrated in the broader church at large. Let us be a church that loves sacrificially. Next, Jesus loved purposely. He had an intention, an aim. He gave himself up for us. He gave himself up for us. When Christ went to the cross, it was not aimless. It was not trivial. It was not a mere spectator event. He had in mind the salvation of sinners, and he knew nothing less than giving his life and death would accomplish that. In the summers, Jen and I, we used to vacation at the beach. Uh, and when you live on the East Coast, that's what you do. It's an hour away, you go to the beach. And at the beach, it always blew my mind that there would be these little low-flying propeller airplanes with banners behind them. You know what I'm talking about? The little banners that usually say, like, five ninety nine, dollars come have lunch at Red Lobster or something after you're all tired of the sun. But sometimes it wasn't just an advertisement. Sometimes it was this declaration of love, like, Joey loves Jenny. And I'm like, what in the world? That is the most pointless, aimless, unnecessary demonstration of love I've ever seen. What if Jenny's reading her book when the plane flies by? What if by the time that plane flies by, in between the time Joey paid for it, Joey doesn't love Jenny? Or if there's five Jennies out there, what, Jen, don't ever let me do that and don't ever do that for me. Aimless love. The love of Christ is not a fly-behind-airplane banner. The love of Christ is a purposeful, needed, sacrificial love. It's the kind of love where a father sees his house burning down and knows his son is stuck in the crib. That father runs in the house, no questions asked, no matter what room that baby's in, and he gets the baby out to safety. The love of God for us runs up to the cross. It rescues us out of the burning eternity that we deserve. And it says, I'm going at the cost of my life. I know that house is burning down, but I'm going for that baby. That's the kind of love, the intentional, the purposeful sort of love that God has demonstrated for us. Remember what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 18? Christ suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. Sound like a purpose to me, to bring us to God. Not just forgive us, but to bring us to him. Christ was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, peace with God, was upon him. By his wounds you are healed. Do you want healing? Any peace for eternity? Only Jesus offers that. The love of a father that runs into a burning building to save his, his trapped child. A purposeful love. And then finally, Jesus loved us with a delightful love. Look with me at the end of the verse. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus loved us to the point of delighting God as he loved us. It's like the smell of like a field of flowers after you walk out of the locker room. You get out of a locker room, you like leave the YMCA or what, the gym at John Logan. Lloyd knows what I'm talking about. You walk out of that locker room, and it doesn't matter what it smells like out there. It smells better than what is in there. (laughs) A fragrant offering. Jesus is described as a fragrant offering. When God looks upon his sacrifice at the cross, he is pleased. It is like the fresh air of forgiveness on behalf of sinners wafting up to him. And he says, now I look at those rebels who are in Christ Jesus through faith in him, and I am delighted in them. As children. 
See, the Old Testament pointed towards the New Testament at cross as the ultimate sacrifice. You read the book of Leviticus, and you just hear sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. It's as if the priests were just butchers, just like goats and bulls and blood everywhere, just a pool of blood. And yet those were only temporary appeasements. They weren't the fresh air that was needed for eternity. One after another, until there was a perfect sacrifice, a delightful sacrifice for all time. Hebrews 9, this is what Jesus is, is the fulfillment of every Old Testament sacrifice. Look with me on the screen at Hebrews 9, verse 13 to 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, so that's like a kind of partial, temporary, placeholder sacrifice. Verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, the blood, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Jesus died to make us acceptable to God. He died to say that when God looks upon you and you are in Christ, he is delighted in the work of his son that's now imputed to your account. A delightful love. What might it look like for us as a church, one another in the church together, to love one another in a way that delights the Lord? To say, I love you so much so that we're not just going to have small talk for the extent of our relationships, but we're going to share our sufferings and I'm going to encourage you with gospel hope and not just pats on the back. That we're going to share our sin struggles and say, you know what, I'm not a perfect person. Jameson Parker's not a perfect person. I need you to help me put sin to death in my flesh. No one else in this room is a perfect person. What might it look like to love one another so much that we're honest and transparent and say, I need the grace of God, not just unto salvation, but in sanctification. Would you remind me of who I am in Christ and how the Spirit now lives in me to be like Christ? What would it look like for us to be a delightfully loving congregation. Jesus has loved us initially, sacrificially, purposely, delightfully. And yet this love would be without power if it ended in a death, wouldn't it? If this love ended at the cross, what hope would there be for you and I to go and do likewise? But the greatest news of the gospel is that the God who is so mercifully loving is also so eternally powerful that he would beat sin, Satan, and death. Jesus loved you enough to die for you, but then he's powerful enough to win your eternal victory. See, the sacrificial lamb has become the risen king. The sacrificial lamb has become the risen king. After three days in the tomb, death couldn't hold him anymore. He rose from the dead. The stone rolled back. The light of the world came out. And now, that same Spirit who raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in us. That Spirit lives in you and I, giving life to our mortal bodies through Him. You know what that means. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I can live a new life through faith in Christ Jesus. Not because I'm a good person, but because the perfect person died for this person. And now he lives in me. That's a transformative love. That's the sort of love that changes churches, changes the world, has been changing the world for 2019 years. Church, my plea, my desire for us is that we would imitate God as we walk in love as Christ loved us. I want, before we sing and and turn to God in communion and worship, I want you to consider for a moment, what might the Lord be leading me to do specifically to grow in love for those in this body? Think of someone who you don't naturally love, someone you may not yet know. What one thing might the Lord be leading me to do and response to his word opened to grow in and demonstrate love for others in this church. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds right now to write it down. And here's why. If you write it down now, you're likely to do it later. So I won't be offended if you take your phone out and put it as a reminder right now. Write it down. How might the Lord be leading you 
to respond in love to him and others in the church. One specific thing. And as you think about and write that down, What we're going to do now is we're going to transition to a time of celebrating and worshiping the God who has first loved us as we turn to take communion. Communion is this shared meal where those who are in Christ receive the bread and the juice, remembering that his body was broken, symbolized by the bread. His blood was poured out, symbolized by the juice. So you take and you eat, remembering that he is offered an eternal banquet through his body and his blood. Come to him. And if you've yet to come to Jesus, I invite you to receive the bread of life, not just the piece of bread. If you've yet to believe in him, come and talk to me after the service. Come and talk with one of the elders who will be standing and available for prayer. And if you've been walking with the Lord and yet neglected to celebrate this incredible, contraconditional love, Would you just ask God to enliven your heart to love Him based on how He's loved you? Would you join me in prayer as we now turn to worship the Lord in song and communion? Oh, Father, we love you because you first loved us. Lord, we would have no hope for love uh, from you or toward others apart from your reconciling, forgiving, life-changing love in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, we ask that you would be drawing others unto receiving this love, if they've yet to. And yet, and for the rest of us, Lord, enliven this love in us. Let us never be apathetic or coldly complacent or overly comfortable to the love of an eternal Father who's run into the building to rescue us as trapped children from the fire of eternity. You are a good, powerful loving Father, let us worship and adore you for all eternity. We ask you to accomplish this in and through us as a people, your people, your children, this church, at Christian Covenant Fellowship. Help us to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen.